Hi, everybody, and welcome to Sell, Scale and Thrive, the B2B SaaS podcast for founders. This is all about sales, about building your sales capabilities in your organization, because a startup that sells is a startup that scales. Want to create positive impact by getting your SaaS product out to more customers? Then start here. So hello, everybody. We are live. This is Sales Playbook, and my name is Sol. I'm the head of marketing for Sales Playbook, and today I'm here with Manuel Hartman. He is our founder, CEO, and SDR of, of Sales Playbook, and we are so excited to bring you this topic today. It's about ideal customer profile, the foundation of everything, and how to improve it. So we've got a half an hour here with you here on LinkedIn Live, where Manuel will give us his insights on why nailing down your ICP is important for B2B startups and how to go about it. So we'll do this for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then at the end, the second half, we'll have time to go through all your questions. So just be sure to add your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll get to them at the end. And yeah, your questions can be about anything about, um, well, ICP, about the topic we're talking about today, but also feel free to use this time to ask Manuel about any, any sales challenges you might be having um, at your B2B startup. So let's get started. So before we get into ICP, Manuel, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and about Sales Playbook? Yeah, happy to. Thanks so much for the introduction and uh, setting up this event. Um, background for me, like founder, SDR and CEO of Sales Playbook. Over the last three and a half years, we had 200 plus B2B startup founders uh, build and scale sales quickly with um, a sales journey partner offering, as we put it, uh, everything around coaching, training, upskilling and, and helping founders and sales leaders implement quickly. And what we found is everybody comes for leads, for shortening sales cycles, for closing more bigger deals faster. 80% um, of people actually leave with work on the ICPs or the ideal customer profile. Because when you ask, like, where are you most successful with? Why does something take 12 months to sell? Why is conversion rate not higher from proof of concepts to subscriptions? Uh, why is your reply rate like less than 20%? People very often open up, I don't know. I message everybody in every industry with like five use cases. And um, that's a challenge. On the other hand, like some customers that we saw going from zero to seven figure ARR quickly. So that means with less than 80 months uh, from zero to 1 million ARR and beyond. They, what they've been really successful in finding product market fit is really nailing down a niche, really down a certain industry, like company type, buyer persona, use case, problem that they solve. And that, that's the foundation. Once they crack this, like after typically like six to 12 months, um, things go really, really smoothly. It becomes repeatable. They can hire a sales team. They can throw more gasoline at the, at the well-burning fire, so to say, to scale quickly. And that's also uh, the reason why um, I think ICP is so important. I mean, one piece of background, like before Sales Playbook, I built up sales for an e-commerce AI start, SaaS startup in Zurich. And technically, it was automated data integration, transformation, and categorization. And we started with that English-speaking page, Wealthport, and uh, change the name completely to one dot, like where you get all your product data for e-commerce and commerce businesses in one place to sell more products faster online. So this was really the thing, like helping companies to sell more products faster online. And it was not about the AI. It was not about data integration at all. And once we hit that, that message market fit, that niche, that ideal customer profile of commerce people who want to make more revenue online, Things really hit off and like you already work with five customers in this niche, like consumer electronics in Dach, for example, can I be number six? And sales cycles basically like became three, four times faster just due to that because it was really clear what we're up to and where we're the best in uh, the world or at least like the German speaking area. Yeah, and that's why I'm so excited about this ICP topic. Okay, great, Manuel. Thank you. Um, so... <laughs> Then the first question, what is ICP? What does it stand for? ICP stands for Ideal Customer Profile. So there's so many acronyms in, in B2B sales, like business-to-business -business software as a service. 
I think ICP is one to really remember because it's so crucial that, that you get this right. And every serious marketing agency, every lead gen agency, every cold calling center, every growth consultant, every hire that has worked in sales before will ask you very specifically, what is your ideal customer profile? Who will I be selling to? Who am I expecting to sell? Because it's really different if, for example, the customer of ours like Arclet, they um, start pretty much at zero from us and then sold to really large companies like Deutsche Bahn, Pepsi style. And that's really different to close 50 to 500k deals with a Fortune 500 company than, for example, at Bexio, like which our um, lead investor for our seed round, like uh, Jerry Meyer, um, was found in CEO and the ticket size is about like 500 to 1,000 Swiss francs a year. And you sell to really small businesses, like one to 25 people. So it determines everything, like your sales approach, are the people you need to sell, uh, how long the sales cycles are going to take, like how much you can invest in customer acquisition, how long customers are going to stay with you, how you position yourself in the market. And if you're not sure what your ICP is, you're not going to be sure what to build next. Okay, yeah. So um, you work with a lot of a lot of B two B startups, and um, what would you say are the biggest mistakes that they are making when it comes to their customer targeting? I think the biggest mistakes we see is being too broad. It's like, well, we sell to corporates, and then like one of us asks, "Can you be more specific?" It's like, well, financial services, like banks, and that doesn't tell somebody on the other side like am i the right person am i head of compliance or legal or finance which might seem like very similar and then like not being specific enough about the use case so that's one and um the other is just um if things work uh then the founders typically say like hey this works let's do 10 other things let's expand to the us like do three other industries do more use cases do other segments and if things do not work they also say the same thing just for different reasons, like, hey, this does not work. Let's try out three other things. And just staying consistent on one thing that works well, like your most successful customers, and then finding 10 uh, companies and 10 buyers who are exactly like their customer and repeating success. Okay, so why do you think um, B2B startups are defining a very broad ICP or why are they jumping from, from one to another? I think... The majority is just like pressure from the outside to capture like a really large total addressable market and say like we're going to be the biggest coaching platform in the world, just in general, which which coach, coach up can claim with 300 million in funding, right? And like people, the founders basically built for companies before that. If you don't have that, like even Uber or Facebook or so, Airbnb started in like a, a suburb of a city with a very specific use case and then expand outwards. Um, the other thing I think is education triggered that we use to like we go to school, uh, we learn something, we take a test, we get a grade, we move on with life and we do something else. We're not going to solve the same math test for like five years straight, which is maybe intellectually not that stimulating, but ideally your sales is that you get the same test all over again and you're going to score better every time because you're familiar with the answers. Mm hmm. Okay, um, you just brought in a, another definition. So the total addressable market. Um, maybe a lot of people are, are familiar with TAM and ICP, but maybe there's someone on a call who doesn't uh, know what the difference is. Would you mind explaining? Yeah, for sure. So um, let's take Facebook as an example. Facebook, the total addressable market is everybody with an internet connection, which right now is maybe like four and a half billion people, depends on how you count, how regular. And about 3 billion of them are Facebook users. So they capture like two thirds of the total addressable market that's using Facebook. However, when it started, like I think 2004, maybe two decades ago, their niche, their ideal customer profile was like sophomore, like second year students at uh, Yale or Harvard, not sure anymore. Um, so it was like a niche of like 100 potential people. And once that worked, it was sophomore students at other Yale Ivy League universities. And once that worked, it was like first and third year students. And it stayed with students in the U.S. at universities for a long, long time before it did other students like in high school and college in the U.S. And that was for a long, long time until it did ever expanded to non-students outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So total okay, addressable you. market is where you can eventually go. Um, ideal customer profile is who's most successful in what you do right now. Okay, so um, 
a few questions ago, we we talked about why, like what mistakes B2B startups are making with their ICP. So what are the consequences for them if they don't get it right? Running out of cash, um, just too many iterations to find the product market fit. And I mean, they're going to tell you, you, you're not profitable because you didn't hit product market fit. You, you don't have like a repeatable problem you can solve profitably. What happens then is like you go to an investor, you say like we need like 500k or 5 million or 50 million and we need to find out. And then the investor like, okay, he has 500k, go figure. And then run through the cash, uh, you're not fast enough to identify. You go like, we have a hypothesis, well, that one failed, let's try again. Let's raise a bridge funding round. And then you do this and it, the third time you come across like maybe try two times, like third time, that's, that's for me, I'm not going to give you more money because... You cannot prove me a predictable path to predictable revenue. And you, you, you cannot show like how you're going to like scale up from that. So for example, if you have like 20 customers in like 20 different niches and someone is going to tell you like what happens if I give you 2 million, it's very hard to answer because you're just going to do more project work. If you, however, have 10 customers in the identical niche in Switzerland and you're just going to tell an investor like, well, here's that what works. Now we just want to go to Germany, which is 10x bigger market. So we just need like a bit of funding to capture that and move quickly. That's really different. As long as the investor believes your ideal customer profile works the same way in Switzerland as it does in Germany. Okay. So this is probably the question that everybody is wanting to, to find out. Um, how does a B2B startup actually go about defining their ICP and validating it? What steps do you do you suggest and how do you work it with your customers? Yeah, so what's a thing that a B2B SaaS startup and a B2B SaaS startup founder can do to quickly define their ideal customer profile? It's an iterative approach. So based on initial conversation, like on a startup weekend, you typically have like 20 to 50 conversations on a weekend with who you think your ideal customer profile is. And then you're just going to take that information, make a hypothesis, um, build like a persona, build, take all the information that you have and validate the market very often with outbound sales, like email, like calls, like events, um, like LinkedIn messages, to have as many conversations as you can have to learn, to ask great questions, listen, and increase the information flow. And once you do that, you don't stop iterating. So you just go forward. So... In the moment, for example, for sales people, for us, once we closed a 60K deal, which expanded to a 90K deal, um, which I think is still our largest deal in less than three business days, I was like, hmm, that's interesting. That came from a VC referral, like a partner to the founder and CEO directly on WhatsApp. It's like, now's the time, Series A preparation. Um, and these are the challenges that I've seen you solving via the case studies. It was a very fast sales cycle, like three days for like 60K, expanded by 50% so far. Um, way faster than initially we thought, for example, we can also sell to a small and medium business, but they have very different language, very different problems, very different environment. Uh, so you just run data-driven experiments, you run them as fast as possible, learn as much as you can, and then iterate forward. And, and what are these data-driven experiments that you're talking about? A data-driven experiment that, for example, I ran um, back at one dot, like previous company, was our first annual contract like for about 60k seven week sales cycle over christmas was in furniture and it was great i was like okay there's so many furniture companies like lipo obi um bow and hobby and like a few adjacent ones that like we believed this seems to be really like a, a great ideal customer profit because we can build a case study then we can go to all furniture e-commerce companies in Doha. so what it did was running an outbound or actually like five, six outbound email campaigns to have as many conversations as I can and then send out an email at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and got the CEO of Lipo on the phone like three hours later. That's great. But what we found out within like probably four to six weeks or four to eight weeks instead of four to eight months was it was not. The, the annual contract was just a really special case of like a special project and it was not. It was more consumer electronics, do-it-yourself, fashion and marketplaces. These were the sub niches in, in commerce we ended up after countless validations. We also thought, for example, food is huge because Co, Migro, Lidl, Aldi, they must need this, but there was a very strong incumbent solution in place and it was very industry specific. Mm -hmm. And so how, how do you use Outbound to, to validate your ICP? Can you tell us a bit more about that? 
Yes, for sure. I mean, if you've never done it, it's it's really painful, and people have like Excel spreadsheet, and they're gonna look do first name, that last name, at like company name dot com, and then you bounce with this crap, and you land in spam. Um, happened to me. Happened to ninety percent of people. Or you go to somebody who has done it over and over again and can just give you like the cheat code in gaming. It would be like here's the cheat code. Here's how you can unlock all the levels. Here's what works for like fifty plus other customers who build it from zero to. 90% opening, 60% reply, 20 to 30% booking rates. Start really with small batches, like 10 to 50 people uh, that you think are, are really like in the same niche and run these in parallel, like more or less. But I think like, okay, I have a hypothesis. I can sell with sales playbook to B2B SaaS founders in real estate, in mobility, and in energy, which is kind of very similar. Uh, and they're all at the same stage of like 10 to 100 people. I'm going to craft the same mechanism on a message, like same case study format, put it to all of them, and I just measure what comes back, like how many opens, replies, um, booked calls, um, qualified opportunities, revenue comes from that. And ideally, I know like four to six weeks later, which seems to be the most promising segment, so then I can go deeper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so... Can you tell us about um, a case study, one of Sales Playbook customers that's been able to either um, define their ICP or change their ICP and what the impact of their on their business was? Yeah, for example, um, absolutely uh, happy to. I mean, one was really early stage called iKeep. So they didn't even have, they didn't have a product. They didn't even have a website live, but they were just like, we're in the circular economy, take back scheme business. And we don't know if it's like going to be mobile phones or shoes or pet bottles, or if, if our ICP is like really complex or public. And we just helped them, I think within like two months to get an 18% booking rate on cold email at relative scale, like 30 to 70 people and get meetings with like the head of sustainability, head of marketing, head of supply chain of like major companies, like brands that you would recognize. Uh, so it was really like from zero to validate the market and, and define your niche. Then the other one, uh, for example, with, um, with Kian Health, um, they started at, at zero with us like um, in the mental well-being space for companies. And they brought a big network from McKinsey founders, but they also said like, we need to understand what other niches work because we cannot just call our friends and then we hit product market fit. And they discovered one segment in um, industrial field, like about occupational health and safety, which is just a very rich budget, which doesn't go away even during a recession. And then selling way more into segment, which was not obvious before, but just the resonance was really good on that. Mm -hmm. And that resulted in like, um, I keep going from basically zero market traction to just like now focusing on a niche more, much more. And in Kian Health's case to go from zero to seven figure ARR really quickly. I think less than 12 months, yeah. Okay, Manuel, is there anything else you'd like to add on ICP before we get into the questions? From let's, dive the into the question, let's dive into the question, so. I think Ian asking like, what are the dimensions of uh, the ideal customer profile, problem to be solved, size and tech stack. Uh, the problem to be solved is definitely the most relevant one. So if you have three companies and they're of different sizes, but they all have the same problem and you can solve it for them, um, that's way more relevant than if they use Salesforce or HubSpot, for example. The tech stack, for example, is really important if you, you're just like a Salesforce plugin. So I implemented like Aptus, which is a quote to cash solution specifically for Salesforce like six years ago. And then it was just so important that you had Salesforce. Every Salesforce customer was a target for basically configure price quote, getting better offers out, um, getting signing more deals, like getting more transparency. Um, next question, I guess, from Andy Byrne. Most people think they've got enough of a handle on ICP. What's an optimal ICP? What's an MV, MVI, like a minimum viable ICP, and how do you bridge them? I think there's no such thing as an ideal customer profile. Um, I mean, an ideal, ideal customer profile. A minimum viable ICP is once you can formulate who you help the most. For us, for example, is like we help B2B SaaS founders in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland to build and scale sales quickly from zero to 20 million ARR. It's not B2C, it's not small and medium business, it's not like personio ends on like unicorn companies, it's not about product growth, marketing, 
whatever it might be, but it's really about building and scaling sales quickly. Um, how do you bridge them? Like once you have like an initial handle, you have a cost, you create a case that you see like does that case study that transformation from problematic state to another state resonate with other people you think it does. And that's going back to the, the outbound sales motion to the content and so on. So yes, uh, to Jordan's Lawrence point, like it's a dynamic ICP as the product evolves. It's probably less about the product. It's more about your market insights and then you're going to adapt the product to um, where you, you can have the biggest impact. Next one from Philly Vandenberg, just customer dimensions or also vendor dimensions and the profit in the IC, ICP segment and can we make money off the ICP companies? So that, that's a whole other segment, like how profitable is that? For example, I know a founder, um, he's closing like six figure deals with like major companies. And I asked him, what's the business case? Uh, how do you calculate it? And I was like, I've never did it. Uh, it's just budget that needs to be allocated for digital transformation and leadership and learning in these major companies. And it's just a very profitable ideal customer program that doesn't even need an, a, budget, a budget case for it. Um, Jan Schuster is asking, once the ICP is figured out, how can we communicate more value based to them, how to be more effective in delivering pain points, for example? Um, one is like, once you understand the ICP, like you can just really deep dive on um, the pain points and how, how what's needed to solve that. For example, like Sol asked me like, hey, what's a topic every B2B startup founder in DAC struggles with on this zero to 20 million journey? It was like ideal customer profit. Like why? Like, well, the questions that we're discussing here. Um, once you do that, build case studies, run webinars, build content on it, um, to just like help as many people as you can understand the why and then like help them understand the what. And then typically if they do the what, they either they implement themselves, which makes them successful, makes them happy, or they're going to come back to you and it's like, I agree with the why. Thank you for explaining me the what. Now can you fix the how for me? Next one. Good, good questions coming in. So thanks for, for bringing them on. Um, from Chris Kulduk is, um, if you find some niches that seem to work based on initial iterations, would you suggest focusing all your energy on those to play them out before doing more iterations, or is it better to continue to split your time? Uh, split your time a bit, but go go like 80-20. It's like a Google approach, like Monday to Thursday, you work on a core business, you make that really successful, you scale positive impact where you can, and then you take maybe like 10 to 30% to validate um, new things and say so like, hey, if banks where for example that do insurance also work because they got similar compliance regulations and then you find out quickly can you scale that or if you can work with like a, a Zürich Kantonal Bank, Grabinder Kantonal Bank is probably going to be very similar but can you be successful at UBS which is just way bigger same problem slightly different requirements Question from Dara Grelish from 56K. Uh, how do you handle a case where a B2B startup has a complicated offering that has at least two ICPs? Um, right. At one point, that can make sense um, that you have multiple ideal customer profiles. Um, if you have different offerings and you match like the ideal customer profile with an offering, so you can have case studies, channel, maybe even salespeople to do that. Um, you do that typically once your startup matures like towards Series A or like one seven figure annual revenue that you have multiple business line for a long time it's very desirable that you solve one problem for one icp really well and just kill the hell out of it um if you have two then then just like make it make a use case based so like hey we solve two problems for us for example that's um helping go zero to product market fit we have a really strong track record over the last three and a half years and that's like zero to one million ARR, and then it's like one to twenty it's like building and scaling sales quickly once you hit product market fit. Question from uh, Claire Houston um, from Houston & Co. How do you keep your ICP adaptive without losing focus? Do you have a structured process and timeline for adjusting your ICP or do the marketing that you talked about have a, to reach a critical threshold before you decide to adapt it? And how do you approach this at sales playbook? I mean, constantly iterate. Um, once uh, you see that, for example, people use different language, adopt the language, right? For example, um, we lost 160K, uh, 160,000 US dollar opportunity back in April. 
because um, it was about building our bond sales, which they didn't have in place, niching down message market fit. And this was a series B company, so just raised 40 million, still valid around this ICP conversation. And at one point, the VP marketing came in. Um, the VP marketing was a bit concerned that we go into his garden and it's like, hey, we like lead gen, that's in my domain. Messaging is in my domain. Like, what's in for me? And we didn't have the messaging like published and we didn't have it ready for a, a head of marketing. Because initially, we only sold to the founder. And then it's like, well, senior sales lead is often not as hungry as hands on. And then we had sales leaders coming in, really hungry hands on people, like the fat offended, they killed some of our deals, rightfully so, I guess. And now we had suddenly head of marketing in a Series B company. So constantly, learn you iterate and with that prospect we jumped on a debriefing call and we got out with like 10 things where we need to improve our own messaging because it was not clear to them so every time you win a deal ask prospects like why did we win like what what resonated with you every time you lose a deal ask the same question like hey what did we fail to bring to the table and um, what what would you need to better understand next time to actually uh, start a collaboration I think we got like three minutes left. Just wanted to make sure we cover all uh, the questions from the audience. Um, any last questions from an audience? One more or also from your side, so. Yeah, I mean, I have a question. I think it's building on, on Claire's question. So um, when is it or... Well, let's put it this way. What are the signs that that you have to look out for that will show you that your ICP isn't working? That it is not working. Yeah. I think if you experience really a lot of friction, right, that like trust doesn't build up organically. Like if you ask to like do a lot of like proof of concept work and, and come physically and like create a case study and like do some free work and like, it's like I'm not sure I need another call. Um, so if people just don't get it, like it's not easy for them to understand, evaluate and buy. And even if you ask for like 10, 20 K, like relatively low in B2B and it's like, mm, this is difficult for me to justify. On the other hand, like you have signs that it's working really well. If people say like, Hey, um, this is a no brainer. Like when can I wire you 50 K because it creates so much value for me. And, and I tried fixing this and I agree with your messaging and can I buy so I had in my life people anywhere from bi-weekly call for two months or six calls um, to somebody buying for 10K in like a 20-minute call. I was like, I looked for a sales playbook on Google, then I found the HubSpot thing, doesn't fix my problem. I need also like a human by my side, found you, so um, I'm here to buy. Uh, what else? <laughs> How do you work? And like in 20 minutes, it was over and he renewed two times. Okay, thanks. We've got a last question here. So do you have examples of how ICP and buyer persona complement each other instead of one being more important than the other? Yeah, absolutely. So I ideal customer profile is typically the combination of the company like uh, that, that you're tackling and the persona buying it. So for example, in my previous startup, I had one that it was like a head of e-commerce or like a chief digital officer who was responsible, like who had their use case to on board, like um, sell more products faster online and, and in that metric of, of increasing gross market value. At Sales Playbook, for example, is this combination of a B2B SaaS startup and the, the persona of a founder. Like that's an like economic buyer that's, that's going to sign the DocuSign. And then we have other personas inside of that ideal customer profile, like a VP sales or like an account executive. They're also very interested in getting value from us. Um, very often, the, the account executive might not be able to sign a five-figure amount with us, but that's also a buyer persona within our our buying center. Yeah, so um, I think we, we're running out of time a bit here, but if you're um, interested in continuing this conversation, can really recommend uh, to book a one-on-one -on -one call with us, like uh, where you will um, get help to understand where you are today on your ICP and otherwise where you want to go, like by Christmas 2023. Uh, what's lacking right now, like what are top challenges and how we can solve them. Uh, free of charge, uh, no holds barred. And um, yeah, just go to thesalesplaybook.com, uh, click the 
uh, Orange book a call about me for Bright and looking forward to learning more about your business. Okay, we got one last question in here. Do you have one more Let, minute? Yes, let's take it. Um, um, how do you iterate on an ICP without ample urgency or even the possibility for an, for an actual transaction? Um, for long sales cycle uh, products, like machine learning heavy product, this becomes especially tricky. If there is no possibility for an actual transaction, it might mean that the problem is just not there. What you can do is like you start with consulting and then a productized service, and then you build the product for to solve that problem. So for example, the, the initial name sales people comes from me doing like 30, 40 sales workshops and always going through the same messaging to find ideal customer profile, quite frankly, and just solving this problem. Um, a machine learning heavy product is not an, a long sales cycle necessarily. It really depends on a problem you want to solve. So for example, I know of a learning management system in like e-learning uh, sales cycles were five months. COVID hit, um, and then somebody like a dean of an executive MBA called on Friday and was like, hey, when can we start working with you? We need to teach people remotely. And I was like, well, when do you want to start? It was like, well, as soon as possible, we have a batch and everybody's paying 100K. And I was like, well, we could start next week, but then I would need to sign you an offer. It's going to be roughly 50K. I looked at your company before, and the person was like, fine, done. And the sales cycle went down from five months to five days. Same product, um, same complexity, no machine learning, but still we, we had like tons of machine learning products and the sales cycles vary like the companies anywhere between like a few weeks to like a few years, but it's not a product thing. It's a, it's a product market fit and a message market fit thing. And that is dependent if you nail down your ideal customer profile or not. Cool. Okay, thank you so much, Manuel. This was very insightful and um, I hope everybody enjoyed this and got a lot out of uh, learning a bit more about ICP. Thanks so much.